We're going to look at Mark chapter 9. We believe that the King James Bible is the perfect, pure Word of God because if you don't demand a perfect Bible, then what's going to happen is there are verses that you're going to look at where you're going to think that some verses, they don't really mean what they say. And when you think like that, how do you know that the doctrine the verse teaches is the right one? And then how do you know your Christian doctrine, your whole Christian faith is the right one if the verse can't even say itself correctly? So that's why we demand a perfect Bible. We truly demand a perfect Bible. We're going to look at the book of Mark. We're going to look at the book of Mark. Now, the common criticism against the King James Bible is that they don't understand the wording of the King James Bible. Now, how many of us did not understand the King James Bible when we first read it? I, I'll raise my hand too. We all didn't, right? Let's be honest. You're not smart, okay? If one of you says, oh, I understood it from cover to cover as soon as I read it, to be honest, I think you're lying. But if you are, good for you, all right? I really mean that. Good for you that you understood it. But I'll be honest with you. When you first open it, you don't understand it. So the common criticism against the King James Bible is that it's too hard to read. KJV is too hard to understand. That gives the excuse to turn to modern versions. Now, let me give you a simple answer why you should not turn to modern versions. The simple answer is, when there's a Bible that corrupts the important doctrine of Christianity, there is no excuse for you to sin. That's the point. The point is, just because the KJV is too hard to understand, it never gives you an excuse to do something wrong. If it's a wrong Bible that corrupts the right doctrine, that's a wrong book. That's a wrong thing. So that's why you should avoid it. Why would you use something wrong? Especially when you're praying before your Bible reading. Lord, please best bless my Bible reading. Bless a Bible that, has, that corrupts God's words, that corrupts God's doctrine. See, that doesn't justify it. So just because, let's assume that this excuse we don't have an answer for. Now I'm going to answer this, but let's assume we don't have an answer to this one. It does not give any justification whatsoever for you to do something wrong. That's important for you to understand, folks. Now, Mark chapter 9, verse 30, you got to understand this. Let's even assume Jesus spoke in a plain language. Jesus spoke what, what G, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, he was speaking in their language, not archaic English, archaic Hebrew, whatever. He was speaking in their language, but yet notice that in their current language of that time, they still found it hard to understand. So here's the point. The point is, even if God spoke to you in a language you can understand, I'm going to, let's be honest. If you're a spiritual newborn believer, are you honestly going to say, oh, I comprehend what God's saying? Let's be honest. Even if he spoke in your current language, there are going to be some things you will still find difficult to understand. That's the point. So that's no excuse. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 30. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he, <coughs> excuse me, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. So that's just very plain and simple to understand. Jesus Christ is going to be crucified by human beings, and he's going to raise himself from the dead. But look at verse 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Now look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Let's even assume God directly spoke to you. And I'm saying like directly, like in a vision, revelation, the Bible was direct vision revelation to you. Even if you have something plain like that, let me tell you something. You'll still find it difficult to understand. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 12. Now look what Daniel says. Daniel chapter 12. And notice what the Bible says. Did Daniel understand it? No, he even found it difficult to understand. Look at verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. 
Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on the, this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. Verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into, unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but what? I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So you'll notice right here that people will still have a difficult time to understand. Why? Because the point is, folks, is that we're talking about the words of God. Words of God. Now go to the book of 1 Corinthians 2. Well, then how am I going to understand the KJV? Simple. You spiritually grow. The point is, when you spiritually grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why church attendance is important, so that you can hear the pastor teach from the Word of God so your spiritual knowledge can grow. Uh, the stuff that we put online is important for you to learn, so your spiritual nature can grow more and learn. Reading the Bible over and over again is important so that your spiritual nature can grow. And when you keep doing that, what's going to happen is, then you'll eventually understand your Bible reading when you get used to reading it. The point is, everyone has a hard time understanding the Bible the first time that when they read it. But it is a common fact, whether you're saved or lost, it's a common fact when you read a hard book, a book with hard wording, if you read it over and over and over again and you get used to it, then you're, the rest of the reading is going to unlock and you'll understand. I'm going to tell you something, the KJV, what you're going to find out is the simplest English you'll find out to understand. Amen. I find this more easy than reading legal writings, trust me, legal cases and law books, etc. I find the King James Bible much easier to understand. Why? The reason why is because I read this over and over again, and when you do that, what happens is your spiritual nature grew so much to a point where the rest of it is like common sense, and you're going to go, oh, I understand this. Quick testimony, Tom Cho, you saw him teach the Bible. But you know when he first came to our church, you know what he said? He couldn't understand what he was reading from the Bible. And he kept saying it after a couple months. And I told him, look, brother, trust me, just keep reading. Just keep reading. Trust me in time, you're going to understand. Now when you ask him, I asked him, so how's Bible reading? Is it difficult to understand? And he says, no, not anymore, pastor. I got it now. And I sometimes find it much more simple than I thought before. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. See, the spirit of the world. People are used to this world's kind of communication language. And a worldly Christian should not have the world's kind of language when he's reading God's word. Otherwise, that spirit of the world for a worldly Christian will not comprehend the Holy Spirit, the spiritual words of God. But the Spirit which is of God, see that? That's contrasted from the Spirit of the world. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's how you know. It's because of the Spirit of God within. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You don't need the scholar's wisdom of the NIV, NESV, to pull up, easy enough English for you to understand because that's not how God's word operate according to Paul. What did Paul continually say? But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why can't he know the things of the Spirit? Because they are spiritually discerned. See that? It's only through spiritual discernment. That's why it's so important in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. You got to have the spiritual nature within you, that Holy Spirit within you to grow. When you have spiritual growth, it's going to understand. 
Spiritual growth will make you understand this simply. And trust me, it will be simply. It will, you'll be surprised how easy that Bible is to read when you spiritually grow. So we saw 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14 on that one. And we're going to look at one more verse. Well, there are two more verses, but let's just go to one more verse for time's sake. We're going to look at the book of 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. The other verse I was going to show you was Ecclesiastes 8. And I believe it's verse 4. This is an important argument. Do you know why the Lord made your King James Bible the archaic Elizabethan English? Here's the easy answer. Why did God give you the Elizabethan English of the King James for you to read? Not the English of today. Do you know why? The easy answer why is because in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4, the Bible says, where the word of a king is, there is power. King James Version. God's word is found in a king. But that's not the basis of my argument. The basis of the argument is the word of a king has power. God is our king of kings. So his word should have authority and power. When you read that King James Bible, that kind of Elizabethan English has authority and power compared when you read the NIV, the ESV, and don't deny it, you know I'm right about that. When you read the modern versions and you compare the reading of the King James, which English language has authority and power? The King James. Are you going to say, go to Hades? Or are you going to use the cuss word, go to H-E-L-L? Why do people want to say H-E-L-L? That authority, that power. Why do people want to take Jesus' name in vain? Because of authority and power. But modern versions say, take out the name of Jesus. See, diminishing the authority and power. Why do people want to make fun of Christians? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Why do they use the thou? Why can't they say you? Because they know that's more authoritative for the Christian faith. Thou. Oh, I don't like the these and thous. Well, unbelievers even have more common sense than you believers. Knowing that the thous and these are authoritative for the Christian faith, that's why they would make fun of it. Now we're going to look at 1 Samuel 9. The point is, that's why God gave you that kind of English King James Bible. That kind of English. Because he wants to give you the best kind, the most authoritative kind of English. So why not the King James Version compared to modern Bibles today? See, he picked the best English language. There is no other time period that is more rich than that time period. All English scholars know that as well. I mean, I majored at English at the University of California at Berkeley. During that year, it was actually the top, even above Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. And while I was in those classes, I was taking a Bible class at UC Berkeley, and they were poking fun at modern Bibles, and they were raising the standard of the King James. Why? Because the reason why is just because of the English language. They say, start with Genesis 1.1. Look at that wording. That King James Bible is much better than modern versions. That's what my UC Berkeley professor and UC Berkeley students were commenting on. Unbelievable. See, even modern scholars have common sense. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 9. You know what you do, what you should do with archaic words? Leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Don't complain about it. I mean, even Saul did that. Look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the who? Seer. That word seer is archaic. Keep reading. For he that is now called a what? Prophet was before time called a seer. But what did, what did Saul do? Saul didn't care about that. Saul, he realized that even though that word seer was four time used, he doesn't make a big deal out of that. Notice verse 10, then said Saul to his servant, well said, come let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. You also notice right here that at verse uh, 6, and he said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. 
All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. Where have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Verse 11, And as they went up the hill to the city, they found the young maiden going out to draw water, and said unto him, Now did they say, Is the prophet or seer? Is the seer here? Why did they use seer, not prophet? Prophet, in that verse 9, they said, currently it's called prophet. Seer was archaic. But why did, use, why did Saul use the word seer? Because he doesn't make a big deal out of it. So look, if the, if the Bible doesn't make a big deal out of it, about archaic words, why do people make a big deal about archaic words today? That one I don't understand. I don't understand. If it's because you have a hard time understanding, that one I can understand, all right, if you have a hard time understanding. But like I told you before, even if it's updated to your current language, I'm going to be honest with you, that's the word of God, not the word of man. And we can't put worldly wisdom on that one. When you have God's wisdom for you to hear the word, trust me, even if it's updated in your language, you're going to still find it hard to understand. That's the point. So we see all that at 1 Samuel chapter 9 that, look, don't make a big deal about archaic words. Archaic words, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. I mean, even Saul did that. You know what Saul was? He was a demon-possessed king. That's what he was. And he murdered people. I mean, if a demon-possessed murderer has better sense to just leave an archaic word alone, why can't say Bible-believing Christians? 